Hello and welcome to Pulse Check with Archer Nursing, where nursing comes to life. In this podcast, you give us 15 minutes of your day and we'll take one complicated nursing topic and make it easy. Ready for nursing to be fun? I'm Morgan and today we're going to talk about epilepsy. So to get started, let's kick it off with our practice question. As always, save the right answer for later and we will circle back at the end of the episode. So the nurse is caring for a client diagnosed with epilepsy. They should anticipate a prescription for which of the following medications select all that apply. We have A, topiramate, B, risperidone, C, prazosin, D, hydroxazine, and E, lorazepam. So now to talk about epilepsy, first we have to talk about seizures. And it's important to know that seizures are not a disease themselves. They are a symptom. Think of them like the brain's fire alarm going off. Something has triggered abnormal, excessive electrical activity, and now the neurons are firing all at once and in an uncontrolled storm. The result is everything from a brief stare-off to full-body convulsions, or tonic-clonic seizures, and that depends on where and how all that electrical chaos spreads. So if seizures are a symptom, what are they a symptom of? It's a whole list of things, things like an increased intracranial pressure, an infection like meningitis, a TBI, traumatic brain injury, drug or alcohol abuse, even extreme glucose imbalances or electrolyte imbalances. All of these can flip the switch and trigger a seizure. So our first thing to do when someone has a seizure is to look for what the cause is. Because remember, it is a symptom. Now, when none of these causes are found and the seizures are recurrent and unprovoked, then the diagnosis is epilepsy. So to give you like the textbook definition, epilepsy is a neurological disorder marked by recurrent seizures that have no other underlying cause. The brain's electrical system is just wired in a way that predisposes it to misfire. Like the circuit board up there is glitchy and everything is overloaded. Now, someone with epilepsy can have many different types of seizures. Let's talk about how we classify them. There's a couple different buckets. The first bucket I want to talk about is where the seizure is happening. It can be either partial, or we call that focal, where it's limited to one area of the brain, or it can be generalized, which involves both sides of the brain from the start. Generalized seizures are usually more dramatic and can involve full body movement or a total loss of awareness, but not always. The first bucket is just where the seizure is happening, partial or generalized. Then we can break it up by what happens to our level of consciousness during the seizure. During a simple seizure, the person stays conscious. During a complex seizure, consciousness is impaired. So this could be confusion or disorientation all the way up to unresponsiveness. So those are our first two big buckets. Where does it happen, partial or generalized? Do we lose consciousness, simple or complex? Next, people use a lot of different words to talk about the different types of movements you can possibly see during a seizure. The first is tonic-clonic, which is formerly called grand mal. This is your classic stiffening, that's the tonic, and then rhythmic jerking, that's the clonic. Intense and unmistakable. Next, we have myoclonic. These are sudden brief muscle jerks, kind of like a spasm that come out of nowhere. Then we have atonic. This is when we lose that tone. Like all of a sudden we fall or the head drops. We lose that tone, atonic. And then last, we have something called absence seizures. Formerly, this was called petite mal. These are when we stare off, brief blank stares. Often these go unnoticed and can happen dozens of times per day, but the client doesn't remember it happening. Okay, so I go through all of that kind of terminology and classification because knowing the type of seizure is a big thing that helps determine how to treat it, which is really what brings us into our case for today. 
So I'm going back to when I was working on the floor of, it wasn't specifically a neuro floor, but like in the front hallway, it was kind of a square, but the front didn't have rooms. So really rooms on three sides. And on the right side rooms, we had video EEG. So the rooms had like a camera in them that neurologist could monitor. They had specialized EEG kind of like built into the rooms. So we got a lot of neuro clients that always got assigned to those rooms where they would do these video EEG studies. Okay, so I'll explain what that is. I had a five-year-old boy. I had, I think, five clients. This was a med surge unit. But in that EEG room, I had a five-year-old boy who had been diagnosed with epilepsy about a year ago. He had those tonic-clonic seizures, and they were generalized, so both sides of the brain were involved. His whole body would kind of stiffen that tonic, and then have that jerking rhythmic, that clonic. So it started off when he was, I want to say about three or four, they had ruled out all organic causes. So there wasn't a tumor, there wasn't meningitis, there weren't electrolyte or glucose imbalances. The seizures were persistent, there was no other cause they could find, so he had been diagnosed with epilepsy. Now they had tried him on a ton of different meds, unsuccessfully. So he was a planned admission for a video EEG study where they were going to take him off all his seizure medication and we were going to sit there and wait and watch for a seizure to happen. So at the time of admission, he had been off all those medications for 24 hours. They were out of a system. We were waiting, watching, and tracking. We were capturing every movement, every motion on that video EEG so that the neurologist could watch him have the seizure, watch the brain activity, and map out, you know, hey, what area of the brain is involved? And that would help them guide decisions about, should we put him back on meds? Should we consider a surgical option, a VNS? Other things like that that we'll talk about in a moment. So what had he been on before? Lomotrigine, one of the most common anticonvulsants for long term. And then he had also been on topiramate. He had been on levacitrasum or Keppra. He had been on phenytoin. And, you know, some of these multiple medications at the same time, some separately. And they really had not been great for him. Classically, these medications work by calming down the brain's hyperactive neurons to prevent those like short bursts of abnormal activity from getting out of hand. They have to be taken consistently. We don't stop them suddenly because they can trigger a seizure. In this case, that's what we're wanting to do because we're wanting to watch that seizure. Another key takeaway is, especially if they're on phenytoin, we have to monitor the therapeutic range of these drugs. We get serum levels to see, is it too low? They're not protected. Is it too high? Risk of toxicity, because they have some narrow therapeutic range. Okay, so those are the like long-term control meds, but there's a whole nother half of this with breakthrough meds or like rescue meds, kind of similar to like asthma, right? You take your long-term med to keep your asthma under control and then you have a flare up so that you need to take your albuterol. Same sort of story for seizures. With a breakthrough seizure, this kiddo had a PRN order at home. It was for diazepam that would be given rectally and it would stop a seizure in progress, okay? So those emergency medications, usually it's a benzodiazepine, they enhance the calming effects of our GABA neurotransmitter. This is our brain's like natural inhibitory neurotransmitter. And they kind of like yeah, slam the brakes on the seizure, okay? So I tell you all of this ahead of our story here because I want you to understand how these meds work in the context of what's about to happen. So I get ready for my shift. The first thing I do, I've got a kiddo who we're waiting to have a seizure. He needs to be on seizure precautions. Safety first always. This means bed in the lowest position, all four side rails up and padded. And for me, what's most important, oxygen and suction got to be ready to go and functioning. Not just in the room. I have made this mistake, you guys. You're not just like, yeah, I see that suction over there. You have checked that it is plugged in and actively working. If we have got to suction him post-ictally, he's aspirating. We do not have time to set this up. If it's broken, if the tubing's missing, we don't have time for that. So check it at the beginning of every shift. The other thing you got to check for, look for your orders and make sure you have a dose of their rescue med. 
pre-drawn up, labeled, ready to go. Of course, follow your facility protocol. Some places might not let you draw it up ahead of time. Where I was working, this was part of our safety checks. So he had an order for lorazepam IV. We had an IV placed in case he had a seizure we couldn't stop. Because we knew like, hey, he's a he's off his meds. He's going to have a seizure. We're, we're counting on it. The neurologists need to see it. But my order said if he stopped breathing, if he was apneic, or his seizure lasted more than five minutes, that was when I was cleared to give the lorazepam. So I want to have it ready to go. And sure enough, like two-ish, two and a half hours into my shift, he had a seizure. So what do we do? What do we do when someone has a seizure? You don't panic. It's very easy to panic. It's very hard to watch. But you want to stay with the client and go ahead and start time. You want to have a timer, look at the watch, look at your clock, whatever. Observe and document the duration and the characteristics of the seizure. So remember, we've got video EEG going on in this case. The neurologists are watching what's going on so they can see his movements and see it with his brain activity. I am just keeping him safe. I'm removing objects that could hurt him, cushion his head, loosen any restrictive clothing. As the seizure comes to an end, you want to kind of get in a sideline position and keep the airway clear. That's why we have our suction ready. What we don't do is we don't restrain him. We don't put anything in his mouth or a bite block or unclench his teeth. You know, that's how you get your finger chomped off. You just protect him. Keep that airway patent. We've got that suction and oxygen ready to go. And again, we are monitoring, documenting duration and what things look like. Okay. So this client, he started seizing. We start the clock. And at two minutes in, he went apneic. He started breath holding, turning blue. His oxygen saturations dropped to the 40s. Okay, not everyone will do this when they seize, but it is a risk. And that's why we've got our lorazepam ready to go. He went apneic. I had already drawn up and double checked the med. There was a nurse documenting for me. I said, I'm administering the lorazepam. Gave that IV as another nurse was going ahead and grabbing oxygen. Now, he's not going to need to be on oxygen long term, but in the intermediary, while he is apneic, we had that oxygen ready to go at the bedside. And it only took about 60 seconds after giving that IV lorazepam that we halted the seizure. We got the brakes on it. That benzodiazepine calmed down his neuroactivity. He started breathing again, and his O2 sats rebounded. And we could take that nasal cannula off right away. If we hadn't had that lorazepam ready to go, if we had been running around trying to find that med, we didn't have oxygen, he could have gone into full-blown respiratory arrest. So this is where like your safety checks, your prepping, knowing your orders ahead of time, 100% can save a life. If you've got a client on seizure precautions, you're thinking they could have a seizure, this is really important stuff. You do not take those safety checks lightly, okay? Now, fortunately, after this seizure happened, it was a, a tonic-clonic generalized seizure. They saw in his brain where it was happening. They were able to look at his activity. They got a lot of data from that. And the neurologists were able to identify this is where the seizure focus is. This is the type of activity. And they could adjust his treatment plan. What they decided for him, because he remember, he had been on phenytoin. He had been on topiramate. The Keppra, quite a few things that hadn't worked or hadn't worked enough. And they decided to do something called a VNS, a vagal nerve stimulator. This is a little device that goes under the skin in the chest and it can send electrical impulses to the vagus nerve, that's cranial nerve 10, that travels up to the brain and that helps prevent seizures. So because this kiddo wasn't fully responsive to meds, that was what they went with. He did go home, I believe, on Keppra to hold him over. And he might end up staying on that. He's going to have very close neuro follow-up for continued treatment and adjustments. Because as he grows, gets bigger, this epilepsy could get better. It could get worse. It's very hard to predict. It's very individualized. So we have close, close follow-up with a neurologist that helps guide that treatment. Okay, but you know as the nurse, what's your key takeaway? Safety checks, oxygen suction at the bedside, you're ready to go, you know your meds, and you're ready to administer them. With that being said, let's keep those meds in mind and circle back to the practice question, 
where we have a nurse caring for a client with epilepsy, which prescription would we anticipate? Okay, select all that apply. We had topiramate, risperidone, prezosin, hydroxazine, and lorazepam. Select all that apply. Jot down which of those meds would you anticipate for a client with epilepsy? Correct here is A, topiramate, and E, lorazepam. Topiramate, that's one of our long-term maintenance anticonvulsants. Help us keep those overexcitable neurons calm and reduce the risk of seizure. And then E, lorazepam, that's your benzo, your emergency med that works fast to halt a seizure where they go apneic or it lasts longer than five minutes. Okay, the other meds, risperidone, that's an antipsychotic. We use it for schizophrenia and bipolar disorder, not for epilepsy. C, prezosin, that is an antihypertensive. We don't give that an epilepsy, no role in seizure control. And then D, hydroxazine, that's an antihistamine. It can help with anxiety, not useful for epilepsy. Okay, so a couple key takeaways, management. We've got maintenance meds to prevent rescue meds to stop in their tracks. And as the nurse, you got to know those meds. You got to do your safety checks, really checking that oxygen suction, having that emergency med ready to go can be life-saving. All right, future nurses, that is a wrap. If you found this pod helpful, I'd love to continue supporting your nursing journey through nursing school, the NCLEX, continuing ed, and beyond. Archer Nursing has you covered with on-demand video lectures, high-yield question banks, live case study reviews, and so, so much more. We want to help you master tough concepts and make it fun. So join us over at archerreview.com. Follow us on socials at Archer Nursing for more free nursing tips and study resources. Thanks for tuning in to Pulse Check with Archer Nursing. I'm Dr. Morgan Taylor, and I'll see you back next time.